Let's get joined up. This week's show is sponsored by Bandcamp.com, an online record store and music community where passionate fans discover, connect with and directly support the artists they love. There's thousands of bands and artists on there, including my band, The Rye Dogs, whose second album, Pigs Might Fly, is out right now. Here's a quick snippet of the title track, which is also available on Spotify, Amazon and Apple Music. Because your eyes may be weeping, but your conscience is sleeping. It's totally free to join Bandcamp, and as the Rye Dogs are brand new members, we're now looking to grow our fan base, so your support would be greatly appreciated. Just search the Rye Dogs, that's W R Y Dogs, and hit the follow button. Right, now we can cue the theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 157 with A.D. Barker, author of dark novels and stories, including his latest ghostly book, Society Place. We chatted about how he overcame his struggles with literacy and education, how he finds the discipline and time to write, and loads more about his process and journey to publication. Uh, This episode is actually a week later than I expected it to be because I've had a bit of a curveball thrown at me since we last spoke. I won't go into loads of detail here, save to say that I had what felt like a pretty serious health scare causing me to collapse several times during a day and meant I spent a number of days in hospital. We still haven't really got to the root cause of it, but I seem to have been fine since the day it happened. I'm kind of hoping it was just a perfect storm of factors, including dehydration, maybe a virus and overtiredness, but I don't know. And I have to have an MRI scan on my heart in the coming weeks, and hopefully I'll have some more definitive answers then. So as you'd expect, the whole thing really shook me up. And as I record this just over a week after it happened, I'm still trying to process it. I'm mid 40s. I'm yes, I'm slightly overweight, but otherwise, I'm very fit and healthy. I don't smoke, I don't drink to excess, and I exercise most days, and I had no warning signs that this could happen at all. So the whole thing was was frankly terrifying. I'm currently a kind of walking cliche. I'm the man who feels like he's been given a second chance and realizes time is finite and I really should be getting more shit done. Um, but it also reminded me how blessed I am to have such amazing friends and family as they've all rallied around me and shown me loads of love and support. And it's also been a timely reminder to make sure that those people know how much I appreciate them being there because, you know, I'm a working class bloke. I probably don't let those closest to me know how much they mean to me enough. And that's definitely something I want to rectify. But I also want to thank anyone listening to this and to all the amazing authors and creatives that I've met since I started the podcast back in 2014. It's a privilege to have so many great conversations with like-minded people and to hear your stories as well, the people out there listening. So that aside, I also want to crack on with my creative projects to keep writing songs and making music, but also to get this bloody novel of mine finished. Before I became an extra in this week's episode of ER, I was actually going to bring some more positive news on uh, on the front of, of making creative projects. Um, I've joined another critique group. It's a weekly online group founded by previous podcast guest Erica Waller and as I type this, the first three chapters of my book Safe Hands are with the group and over the coming days I'll get to hear what they think of it so far. Yes, I am nervous, thanks for asking. Um, To be quite honest, when I discovered who some of the other members of the group were, very established people, some of them with multiple publications behind them, I almost pulled out of the group. I felt totally out of my depth and the old imposter syndrome showed up again. Fortunately, my wife, Ali, saw through my pathetic excuses. She spotted that I was being a bit pathetic and she told me to get a grip. And I did. And with trepidation, I attended the introduction meeting a couple of weeks ago. Predictably, everyone was really friendly and there already seems to be a good kind of nurturing vibe and a sense that we all just want to help each other. I'm still partly amazed that some of these people would think I've got anything to offer them, but I have to shake off such negative nonsense and just crack on. I'm really looking forward to learning as much as I can and also 
to know that this will be a great motivation to keep me going with the new draft. I'm going to have to continue to submit my work, so I need to just crack on with it. So I've had quite an eventful couple of weeks, but what about you? You know I love to hear from you all, so do drop me a line. It means even more than ever now. And I try to reply to every message, and it's brilliant to hear what you're up to and what you think works or doesn't with the show. So if there's anything you'd like to hear more of in future episodes, just let me know. And the best way to get in touch is via email, wayne at waynekellywrites.com. But you can also tweet me at podcast, or you can drop me a line on the FB page. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk. Totally free and you get a couple of downloadable goodies when you sign up, and you'll be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's hear today's interview with A.D. Barker. So Andrew David Barker is an author and filmmaker, born in Derby. He's had pretty much every job going, from window fitter, rail track worker, to carpet salesman and beyond. As a filmmaker, he wrote and directed A Reckoning, and the award-winning short films Two Old Boys and Shining Tour. He's the author of The Electric... Dead Leaves, Winter Frights, The Winter Man, and now his latest novel, Society Place, which is out right now. So enjoy the chat, and I'll pop back at the end for a sign-off. Okay, Andy, thanks a million for coming on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So why don't we just start off just giving us a sense of where you're actually speaking from and tell us about your latest book, Society Place. Hi, uh, hi. Um, yes, I'm in uh, very sunny Lamington Spa. Um, as we're recording this, we're in the middle of a heat wave, so I'm stuck in my office at the minute, and it's quite hot. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, actually this this whole new this is a whole new office. I used to have a writing shed out in the garden, and where that used to be is now the office because we built an extension, built out. Nice. So it's now. It's now an inside. I kind of miss my shed, though. Because you I've can go say. out there, like, it's sort of separate. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a little escape, yeah. but this is not so much because, you know, the kids can find me very easily. Yeah, That's... it's a bit like me. I mean, I'm, mine's not mine's not a shed. It's a, like a converted garage, but it is sort of separate from the house. It's by, by about 10 feet, if that. But it, I do feel like when I come out here, I'm sort of separate. I like it. There's a there's a mental thing to it as well. You think once you go out there, okay, I'm out here. I've got to get some work done. Yeah, it's a bit well, like going really... to the like you say the office or whatever. Yeah, but you kind of I'm still kind of in the house here. Like just next door to me is the TV room. Yeah, I'm just. It's very easy not to do any writing. Yeah, just all those box film. sets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I don't miss that shed in the winter. No, I had a little heater, but it wasn't doing anything, and I don't really miss the spiders either. But, yeah. you know, so it swings and roundabouts. Yeah, I know. It was quite, I was quite, <laughs> ro- I'm, I'm, I think I'm being quite romantic about the shed now. It's probably not as, it's probably it's not gone. as nice as the, my nostalgia. Yeah. yeah. The nostalgia is yeah. making it nicer. The memory, the memory of it. Um, so yeah, my, uh, latest novel is Society Place and it's a, um, it's a 70 set ghost story. Um, and it kind of harkens back to those kind of, uh, novels horror novels for the 70s mm-hmm. james herbert novels um de- even a touch of dennis wheatley i guess um but it's uh it's it's set in derby like a lot of my novels are which is where i grew up and it's it's kind of set on the street and the house that i grew up in for the first eight years of my life which um was kind of lovely to write about because I'm, I'm a very nostalgic person. I'm anyway. getting that already, Andy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just, it's set in the, uh, the, the blazing hot summer like this of yeah. 1976, um, partly. And there's some of it set now as well. Um, but uh, so it crosses sort of timelines, but it's mainly set in 1976, which was a lovely period to write about. I've written about ghosts before in my first novel, The Electric, but they were very um, benevolent ghosts. That was about a a cinema that shows movies made by ghosts. Um, And it was a very kind of uh, bittersweet uh, coming of age story. Whereas this time I I wanted to write something um, a lot darker. And it surprised me how dark it turned out, actually. It's quite a sad, tragic 
story um and i tried to make it um as creepy as i could and what 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 sort of kicked off the idea for you originally do you remember i'm not i it was the idea of um a street not a house not a haunted house i wanted a haunted street where there was beneath the street there was what i termed as a nest of ghosts mm -hmm. and uh and it sort of grew from there just that that idea of something beneath you all along this 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 entire street and it's affecting everybody in the street in varying degrees and um i pretty much straight away knew that i wanted it to be the street that i grew up on i always have an idea of where i want to get to but getting there is is always a bit of a winding interesting journey to take yeah, it sounds great. So obviously, you, as you say, part of it is set in 1976, and you know you've already said you were only little when you when you uh, you know in reality back then, so you couldn't really base a lot yeah. of it on memory. So tell me a little bit about the research. What sort of research did you do? What actually attracted you to that period? Would you say? Um, it was it was mainly my parents and sort of the stories that they tell me about growing up in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and my mum was very young when she had me. She was like 18. So I wanted a young mother in there, to, and which she's in no way based on my mum, other than the situation, I guess. <laughs> you just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, and also um, her brother in the, in the novel plays in sort of a local band doing covers of, you know, music of the day, but the Sabbath deep purple that kind of stuff um and my dad was in a band doing that very kind of uh thing back then and it was just a whole kind of uh atmosphere of how they grew up together in that period that i wanted to to play around with so it's a very because all the, the other novels that i've written are very much from my perspective mm -hmm. growing up in the 80s and the 90s um and for some reason i just had the pull of doing something kind of you know the generation before me so when you've obviously you've as you mentioned before you've written in this genre before so what draws you to the the darker side of the street literally in this case tell us some of your influences um, um well again going back to my parents um they sort of got me very interested in um I think initially got me interested in the horror films that so kind of my dad um, and my mom actually were kind of showing me the old Universal Monster movies very early on. I mean, when I was a kid on BBC Two at like six o'clock, they'd show like oh, 50 sci-fi movies and, you know, I could watch Invaders from Mars or Frankenstein or... Yeah. So all that just got ingested straight away and I loved it. Um and my mum was very inter interested in the supernatural and she'd always talk about, you know, stuff like um, she had like Alistair Crowley books on the shelf and, you know, she's a bit of a witch, I think, <laughs> but, uh, or, or at least interested in that kind of thing. Um, so me, me and my sister grew up with this love of uh, anything supernatural. I don't believe in the supernatural anymore but i used to mm -hmm. and i kind of sad that i don't <laughs> <laughs> because but even if you tell me now if you if we go into if i go into an old house or something and someone tells me oh, this this place is haunted i'm like really yeah <laughs> brilliant i'm that guy yeah. yeah you know but um i don't really um I don't, it doesn't really hold much water with me anymore but to write about it is so much fun mm -hmm. and you can examine I think what I try to do with this one more than the others as well is really examine what it would mean to be truly haunted and how that would affect a person and how that would have a knock-on effect through the generations. That's very much what this book is about, um, how a, a, a serious haunting of this scale could um, damage an entire lineage. Hmm. Um, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just something my imagination just gets fired up by, by, um... just attracted to it. And that's that. So t tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up and what your kind of earliest memory of writing is. I think you were kind of, I think I've read before somewhere that you came to writing sort of a bit later. 
Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Derby um, in the 80s, and um, yeah, writing was always something I was very interested in. I was always looking at books. I, I had a pretty poor education, and it's it kind of a I didn't read very much. I was a TV kid, uh-huh. a movies kid. I got all my stories from from like visual mediums. So I didn't really read anything until I left school mm-hmm. because I didn't think I could. But once I realised that I could actually read a book, I was you know voracious. Yeah. Um, um, and I also left school with this head full of ideas. Um, but a very little education and, you know, very little confidence. Um, so it took a long time to to sort of figure out how to write or at least teach myself how to write. And, you know, I had started writing with a friend when we were about 18. We tried to write a novel, <laughs> which was... Uh, which was a, a strange thing about someone dying and going to heaven and heaven being run by Elvis. I don't really know <laughs> what that was about, to be honest. But but we see, we thought it was amazing at the time. Um, but he was doing all the writing. I was just supplying ideas. It wasn't until later that I was actually sitting down on my own and typing words and trying to form sentences and make something. Yeah, how did you get over that, though? I mean, like you, if you say, if that's... You know, I've spoken, I've I've had other guests on here before that have had, you know, uh, literacy issues or dyslexia mm. in various degrees or or whatever. So, yeah. What? How did you kind of get over it? Did you have to get help from other people, or was it just a case of trial and error? Did somebody give you the confidence it's, to do it? No, it was it was trial and error, and it took a long time. I mean, all through my twenties, I was trying to figure it out and writing you know, writing scripts or short stories. I never tackled a novel until later, um, but I always wanted to. The idea of doing it was very appealing, but I just never never thought I could. And it took a long time. Um, and it was, just, it was just trial and error. I was just writing, probably as many writers do, imitating the people that I admired mm-hmm. and trying to find my own way with it. And it wasn't until my mid thirties that I really sat down and tried to to write properly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's really been a I'm forty six now, so it's been a, like a ten, twelve year journey of really trying to do it properly. And and the first thing I wrote that I was like, well, I've written a story. It was actually a children's book called The Winter Man, which I actually released last year. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I sat on for like a decade. But uh, when I finished it, I was like, okay, this feels like a, a book. This mm-hmm. works. Um, and that gave me the confidence to go and try something bigger, which was The Electric, which was my first novel that got, well, that, that I finished and that got released. Um it's but it, it you know it just took a long long time um and it was many many years and many many hours just sat in front of a computer trying to figure it out so, i still to this day i can't i can't spell very well um you know you need people need to check my books for typos because i can't see them mm-hmm. and it's it's really infuriating it's it's a it, it's a slow process for me, but I just chip away at it one word at a time. I've got faster. Mm-hmm. Um, once I get in the zone, I can really move now. Um, but, um, yeah, it's still something that, you know, it, it's not, I'm not, it doesn't come naturally. I have to really work at it. Yeah. And so with that, that, that uh, first adult book that you, that you said you wrote, uh, The Electric, so what was your path to publication with that? What happened there? Um, that was picked up by a small press in Derby called Boo Books, which no longer exists, um, which was run by Alex Davis, who also oh, yeah. does, um, guy, yeah. also runs Ed, 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 Edge Lit. And, yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. So he had a small press for a, a few years, and that got released in, in hardback 
and then we did a paperback the year after and it seemed to do well it got out there and you know um i've had uh it had a lovely response i mean with any kind of um small press you know the the reach that you've got is kind of limited Mm -hmm. um but for what we did and for what we had I it really got out there and some of the responses that I got from around the world have been quite amazing. Um, so that really spurred me on. That really encouraged me to, to keep going. And after that, I wrote Dead Leaves, which was more of a grittier book about um, set in 1983 during the Video Nasty era about a group of kids well they're a bit older they're like sort of older teenagers just left school trying to sort of bumming around derby wondering what they're going to do with their life and well all they really want to do is just you know sit around and watch horror films and the thrust of it is that they're trying to track down a copy of the notorious video nasty the evil dead Mm -hmm. and get into all kinds of scrapes along the way um so that was um that was a lot of fun that's that almost sounds like the premise of a film yeah. Well, I, I, I have written it as a screenplay as well, but I've had no bites yet. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'd love to make it one day. It's, um, I think it could be a lot of fun. Um, but that that also was picked up by Boo Books, and that did very well. And then subsequently, when Boo uh, closed their doors, unfortunately, as a lot of small presses do, um, Black Shook books picked that up, and that was re-released in paperback through them. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been an interesting journey. It's and working I've sometimes self-published, but I've mainly been going through small presses, and I'm quite you know I'm quite happy with that world. Really, I like I like it. Yeah, I like, you're finding a home um, for your stories. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a wonderful thing, and I'm always like blown away when someone says, "Yeah, let's let's publish this." I'm like, "Wow, this is amazing! I'm gonna get to actually see the book," and it never never stops being a wonderful thing, you know. What does the rest of your family think about your writing? Do like you mentioned your parents, your mum, and stuff like that? What what especially, you know, with you as you said, you had a difficult start in terms of education and stuff like that. What do they think about it? Um, I think they're pleased for me now because they know how much I've worked for it and how much I wanted to do it. Um, but I don't think they truly get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't pay the bills, so therefore it's not real. Yeah. You know, it's um, I come from that world. Uh, yeah, where, I, I relate. You know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's not making money, it's not, it's not real. It's just, you're just playing at it. Whereas I, I don't believe that I'm playing at it. This is what I want to be doing. It doesn't, regardless of whether. Well, and it doesn't matter anyway. Like you're, if you're actually creating it and you're getting it out there anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Hmm. No, no. But I, I actually think you know, in this day and age, if you're, if you're getting up in the morning and um, getting paid to do whatever creative pursuit that you want to do and you're getting paid enough to live off mm. i think you're in a very very lucky position absolutely it's a very very hard thing to achieve now totally um, and and you know like i say that aside there's still there's nothing wrong with creating something for the sake of creating it no and it was never my goal to you know i'm not driven by that just making money out of it i actually want to write the story the stories need to be written and i want to put them out there that's mm. all that's good enough for me yeah um obviously if someone wants to give me that <laughs> oh yeah i'm not uh, turning it down <laughs> i'm not turning it I'm down i'm not a fool <laughs> no but um it's not it's not the main motivator much to my wife's annoyance <laughs> um so, but... so you mentioned your wife there so how do you fit you're writing around real life and i think you've got you've got at least one child i've got two daughters right. and i've got um a job and so is my wife obviously and it's a juggle you know it's it's an act of discipline of you know getting home from work making the dinner getting the kids to bed and then 
and then obviously feeding yourself as well and then sitting down at eight nine o'clock sometimes and trying to pull this stuff out of your head and it's a very you know some nights it's just like oh but i'm pretty i'm pretty good i, I try and write when i'm writing i'm not actually working on anything at the minute which is quite nice but but it's, well i say it's quite nice i always feel a bit lost when i'm not writing mm-hmm. but but anyway i try and write like sunday to thursday mm-hmm. i have friday friday nights and saturday nights a film night mm-hmm. and then i kind of do it as well you know it's um and if i don't write i feel shit <laughs> when yeah. i go to bed yeah but uh you know it's it's a, it's like it's a weird thing writing is because it can make you almost schizophrenic because sometimes you're Sometimes you think, I can do this, this is amazing. And then other nights you get in front of the computer and it's like, I can't. How, how, what, what is these words? How do yeah. you do this? Well, when, when it's yeah. like that, how do you kind of get yourself into the zone? When you've had, music, you've had to park all those things. Yeah, music helps an awful lot. I've got like a 30 hour playlist on Spotify, which is all from film soundtracks. Mm-hmm. that I've sort of put together over a long period of time. Any, I'm always on the hunt for a film soundtrack that's got that kind of real proper, uh, that can kind of get me in the zone. It's got to be something quite dark and moody. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I can just listen to that for a, a while. Um, oftentimes, and I can fall down the, the rabbit hole here, but oftentimes I'll write, I'll watch... Um, you know, writers interviews on YouTube and stuff. And I can, that kind of gets me, oh yeah, this is exciting. I can, I want to do that. Yeah. And I yeah. get back in it. Although, you know, some nights I find that I've just written, I've just, <laughs> all that's all you've done. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, shit, I'm damn. working myself up and it's bed. bedtime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, often, more often than not, if I'm actually in a story, I'm excited to go back to it. The hardest thing is starting a story, I mm-hmm. find. That can be a few nights, a few weeks sometimes of just messing around, really. <laughs> and just, you know, doing every, anything but writing. But once I'm in a story, if I, I, try, and, I try and do, I don't, know, I don't know what writer said this. I think it might have been Elmore Leonard. Well, someone like that said, always, you know, when you finish writing for the day, always finish halfway through a scene. That's right, yeah. So or sentence you can jump, sometimes. Yeah, sentence so you can jump straight back in the next day, and that does work because um, I'm excited the next day to get back and finish that scene. Yeah. And then, you know, you do, and then you're on to the next scene. Um, so that that really helps. And once I'm going on a project, I can't, I'm pretty good at keeping the momentum going. That's the other problem with not outlining, having it in your head, because the forward momentum, when you're writing a novel, you've got to get it out of your head. You've got to keep going to put it down. Yeah, I think it swings and roundabouts with the outlining thing, though, because, I mean, I've kind of done a bit of both. Mm. And my I, I would describe myself as a planter. I'm somewhere in between plotting and and pants in it plant. but what, but what <laughs> yeah. or plantster um but plantster, what like that. but what i tend to find that is if i if i kind of go to town on an outline and i've got a really 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 clear thing of like this happens in this chapter then this happens then this happens this happens sometimes i then lose all enthusiasm for actually writing it i know that sounds that's, stupid that's, because no, no, i think it's sometimes it's the it's the thrill of discovery is what i like about writing sometimes is absolutely you've got a rough idea yeah. and i love it if i've only got a rough idea then when i have to kind of write my way into the scene or a chapter or whatever i often find it doesn't go where i thought it was going to go and it's often better because of that absolutely you kind of yes it, that's my fear of outlining when it come when it comes to novels, is that I'm just going to use it all up, and I'm not going to have that thrill when I sit down and, like you say, those magic moments won't happen because you've you kind of because um, I'm not sure I'm not even sure where those magic those magic moments come from. No, you know they That's they really magic. just appear. That's why they're magic, yeah, <laughs> and they. They're the, they're the absolute thrill of writing, and it doesn't happen all the time. No, but it's happened 
at least once on all, th- all three of the novels that I've written. Sometimes more than once. And when it happens, fun, yeah. it's like, it's just amazing. It's the best feeling ever. Um, there's a line at the end of the electric, which um, I won't say what it is, but it's it just came out of nowhere. And it's quite a critical thing for one of the characters where you've realised that the char- that character, that your whole view of her is different to um how you've kind of how she's been perceived by it because it's all in first person how it's been perceived by the narrator or through the through the story and i didn't know she was going to say it (laughs) yeah i had no idea so i didn't even know that there was a different way of looking at her and i was just like that that's just made the entire book about us yeah, and it was that's the purest uh, magic moment I've ever had in writing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, but if I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got to that if I'd like outlined the whole thing, because I had to know who, who these people were. I had to really dig deep in it mm-hmm. and have them gu- guide me. It's a, you know, sometimes when you talk like that, it's a, it, to people that don't write you must think. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, because it sounds nuts. (laughs) It sounds nuts, but they do become real. Absolutely, in a way. Um, And if they don't, then it's it's not working. You're not doing it right. So, if you were starting again tomorrow as a new writer, what if anything would you do differently, or what would you go back and tell your younger self? Do you think what I'd probably do differently is get an education. (laughs) That might have been the first thing to do, but Mm. I don't know. Just be patient. A bit, a bit more patient, and I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm still not very patient. I still feel like time's running out, and I've not done enough. But in terms of publishing, be a bit more patient, yeah. And probably try, probably try the the whole agent and going out to larger publishers thing, which I think my co- confidence, my my uh you know imposter syndrome stopped mm-hmm. me from doing that quite a lot but um, you can you know there's nothing stopping you doing it now that's for sure Especially no if no some books I, out as well yeah and i think I, I will be doing that um i guess i need to take it well i want to try and take it to the next stage with whatever i do next um but it, you know um but if it doesn't work out I'll, it doesn't work out but at least i'll have known i've got a look at it more as a business in in a in a certain when i say that though i'm saying that and i still don't quite believe it like i don't know if it's in me to even do that or be that person Mm -hmm. but i think if i was going to take it really take it seriously trying to get a living make a you know make a living as an author i'd be more patient and understand that side of it a bit more fair enough and what what, what's been the most helpful piece of creative or inspirational advice do you think that you've been given along the way or that you've you've picked up from an author or whatever well early on early on i got very friendly with simon simon clark Mm -hmm. and he gave me a lot of a lot of good advice and i used to ring him up and ask him loads of silly questions how do i write a character what do I do here? You know, and he was very patient with me and um, really encouraging. And I mean, he, he his whole thing is something that, you know, I've heard other writers say, but it's the simplest thing. And that's you've got to finish it. Yeah. You can't do anything with half written stories. Um, you, you've got once you start a project, you've got to finish it, and you know whether it's good, bad, or, or indifferent, you're going to learn from it. But mostly, when I start something, I have to finish it. I'm, you know, I've got because in my twenties, I've got a, you know a whole box full of half finished stuff up in the attic from when I was younger. But mm-hmm. once I started doing this a bit more seriously, I try and finish everything I start and uh you, you know that's that's been invaluable and it's a simple thing everyone's heard it lots of people have said it it's not so easy to do though it's not so easy to do no but it took simon to actually say it mm-hmm. to like okay yeah i've got to i've got to do that then um so yeah that was the, get, that was the get best it, thing really get it finished yeah. get it finished get it out
That's great. Well, so as we kind of wrap things up, can you give, I know you've not actually started another book, but can you give us a sense of what might be up next? Also remind people where they can find Society Place and um, tell people where they can find out more about you. Uh, well, uh, Society Place is published by Domain Publishing, and uh, there's a paperback copy of that because it's just out and as an ebook at the minute. But there's a paperback copy of that coming out in the end of August of 2021. Um, and you can get that on their site or on the the old Amazon. So yeah, it, it's out there, and uh, you know the actual physical holding your hands you know crease the covers kind of thing is going to be it's out there it. soon yeah it's on it it's, it's, imminent. On it's, yeah, it's imminent it's imminent yeah um i'm um i'm on twitter ad barker um where i just talk about movies and books nonsense um and the odd bit of self-promotion and uh no pictures of my kids or my dinner or you know what what else do pets. people put pictures of pets no pets sorry so it's no pets no kids You're no not dinners selling so it that's, to people. <laughs> no that's what they want isn't it it is yeah, <laughs> yeah. and if oh, you've got no, any that's... pictures of your children with your pet then that's the you oh, hit the big time i'm doing this i'm doing this all wrong holding your book what you basically need is your child riding the dog holding your book <laughs> i did it i did it once when when my first daughter was very young i got a reading a copy of dead leaves well she wasn't reading yeah, it i, I put it in saying. a hand yeah, and, yeah yeah i put it in a hand and say and went smile yeah and then i did it once and uh, of course that's the biggest post i've ever put up <laughs> I bet you got loads of likes yeah 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 i sold 200 I copies like, off that. Like, yeah. yeah i felt like i was famous for once um i have got a website but it's it's desperately in need of an update um it's really old i don't even think society place is on there yet so i've really got to sort my well there you go that's, sort your, my shit out there. that's yeah. your impetus to get that sorted out <laughs> Yes, I do. I need to get that done. Um, as for the next thing, um, I'm not too sure what it is yet. I've, I've kind of been writing screenplays this year because mm -hmm. um, I also make films as well. And I thought I'd, I'd spend this year writing some original screenplays, of which I've written two That's good. so far. Um, I'm just getting them to a place where I feel comfortable enough. Exciting times ahead. Yeah, but there's lots of other ideas that I want to I want to get back to writing a novel next year that's that's the plan and I want Probably it to not. be I want it yeah I want it to be like the one yeah it's going to be the one every, big every one. new one is the, the, the one yeah yeah it's the, and it's also the one where you, every time you sit down to start a new novel you're like how did I do this before yeah exactly. it's like well, I don't know how to do this how to do it yeah yeah Oh, well, that's it's great to hear you've got so many things in the pipeline. Good luck with all of them as well, and good luck with um, Society Place when the paperback comes out as well. Thank you, Wayne. It's been lovely to talk to you, and I've enjoyed this. Yeah, thanks a million. It's been great, Andy. Cheers. There you go. Thanks again to Andrew, and I'll put all of his links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk, or you can find them in the podcast description on whatever device you're listening to this on. So that's pretty much it for this week, but don't forget to get in touch with all your thoughts on the show, feedback, and to tell me what's going on in your writing world. And you can do that by dropping me an email, wayne at waynekellywrites.com. Also, remember you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. So make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And that way you can have the podcast downloaded automatically every episode. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts as it really does help others to find the show or just recommend it to one of your friends because word of mouth is more powerful than anything so that's it for this week thanks for listening i'm wayne kelly happy writing stay safe and i'll see you next time